Hi everybody, welcome to a new episode on my channel. Today my guest is Dr. Simon Blackburn. I will just do a quick introduction to him. Uh, Dr. Simon Blackburn taught philosophy at the University of Cambridge. He is a distinguished research professor of philosophy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He is also a fellow of Trinity College and a member of the Professoriate of New College of the Humanities. He was previously a fellow of Pen Pembroke College and has also taught full-time at the University of North Carolina as an Edna J. Curry uh, professor. He is a former president of the Aristotelian Society. He was elected a fellow of the British Academy in 2002, as well as a foreign honorary fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2008. Dr. Blackburn, it's really an honor to have you on. Thank you for coming. It's very kind of you. Okay, so, okay, so I invited you to talk a little bit about meta-ethics. So, yes. just for people to, who, who don't know about it, could you please tell us what exactly meta-ethics uh, deals with? Yes, the contrast is between what is sometimes called first-order ethics and meta-ethics. First-order ethics is the kind of question you get into when you ask, is something permitted, is it obligatory, is it... Uh, impermissible, it's wrong. Um, so, for example, there are debates about whether, say, early term abortion is permissible, um, that women ought to be allowed to have the choice, or whether it ought, ought to be illegal, which some people think, and um, similar questions. So those are direct questions about what ought to happen, or what ought to be the case, or what people ought to do. And similarly, there are issues which aren't so much about oughts, but are about what's good or bad or better or worse. Is it better to give money to my children or to give money to charity? Is it better to um, uh, look after my you know, immediate family or look after the world, look after the polar bears or, or give money to Greenpeace or something? So there's the, the question about what is better or good or better to do, and question about what you ought to do or must do. And those are questions for first order ethics. Second order ethics asks about the status of our answers to those questions. Are they subjective? Are they matters of culture and history? Are the, uh, is there any hope for objectivity in ethics? Is there any hope for proof? Is there even a notion of truth about these matters? Um, and those are questions about the status, if you like, of ethical discourse. And the typical opponents in this sort of area, some philosophers say, yes, we are realists. We think there's a real issue here, the real truth is fact. Other philosophers say, no, it's a matter of opinion. It's just a matter of attitude or a matter of emotion even. And um, therefore, there'll be never any resolution. There'll be never any proofs or any even good arguments on one side or the other. So that's the that's the that's the ground. Mm -hmm. the, the meta ethics. I mean, meta meaning here about. It actually means after in Greek, but still, um, because Aristotle's books on metaphysics came after the books on physics. That um, meta ethics means about ethics. It's about its status mm -hmm. exactly and so um if you don't mind i would like to go perhaps through some of the main sources that people resort to when they're trying to create or justify an ethical system so yes. in my case i'm particularly interested in what comes from evolutionary psychology or evolutionary mm -hmm. theory because there, there are a lot of scientists nowadays uh, that try to say or to imply that uh, evolutionary psychology by itself, uh, by virtue of uh, telling us uh, how, because we, we evolved in a highly complex social environment, we developed moral sentiments 
and and they say that these moral sentiments are at the basis of the ethical systems we construct and then also during evolution we eventually developed the capacity for abstraction and rationalization and that would be another thing to put into the equation but uh, so uh, I guess that what I would like to ask you about this is would our evolved moral sentiments have been enough to create moral systems? Well, I think so. I mean, something has created them. So presumably it's a combination of evolutionary factors and perhaps historical and cultural factors. I think we, I, I mean, I like the idea of evolutionary ethics, but I don't like forgetting the possibility of a contribution from um, social history, from culture, from uh, perhaps the peculiar situations of different um, uh, different parts of humanity. Um, so people sometimes think that, um, uh, for example, the Inuit who live in the Arctic have a very different sort of sense of survival and therefore different attitudes to life and death. Uh, than those of us who live in more sort of um, comfortable circumstances. Um, and but, but all that will be a function of environment, pressures, society, culture. We've got where we are, not by magic, not because we've got a sky hook to, up to God telling us what to do. We've got where we are because of history. And um, I think any... any uh, evidence of data from history is very welcome. I'm, in, I'm a naturalist in the sense I think it's nature that's made, made us how we are. And um, yes, our attitudes and sentiments and moral feelings are part of our natures. Mm -hmm. But would the moral sentiments that we evolved have been enough, for example, for us to create uh, moral systems as complex as we have today, including, for example, human rights? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I think, I'm not sure our moral systems are all that complicated, um, because as soon as people try to get beyond very simple utilitarianism or very, very, very simple sort of lists of prohibitions like the Ten Commandments, um, it proves very difficult to systematize an ethics in a way that uh, even a significant number of people are going to agree with. So, so I think I'm a bit careful about the idea of moral system, but there's no doubt we have lots of attitudes. And some of those attitudes get expressions in notions like human rights. And this is the idea that there's, a, there's some things which people owe to each other and that they must... Uh, offer to each other, it's other people's due that they're behaved to in a certain way, they're treated a certain way. So if I say it's a human right not to be tortured, um, it's the flip side of saying everybody ought not to torture anybody else, which I believe actually. Um, and, um, you know, I can campaign for that, I can um, give money to Amnesty International, I can uh, uh, avoid going to countries which behave badly in this respect, um, and so on. So, so sure, it's a notion that I can deploy. I use that notion, and um, obviously I, I stand by it, and it's an important part of my my self image, my my persona. Um, would evolution be enough, or evolution and society and culture be enough to give me that notion? Well, it has been enough. I mean, it's it's not an accident that. I have it, and many other people have it. Um, and of course, even people who don't, um, who aren't very strong, let us say, on the rights of others, are often very hot about their own rights. <laughs> it's a, it's a natural asymmetry, just as we're selfish, that we get very hot under the collar very quickly when our own rights have been infringed, even if we're a bit lukewarm about infringing the rights of others. And that's, that's part of what ethics is there to try to cure, 
Um, we're not a naturally a tremendously nice animal. Um, and uh, one of the things ethics tries to impose is a sense of, um, well, a sort of Kantian sense in, 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 of um, it not being appropriate. I can't, I can't do anything. I can't, I can't admire anything unless I can admire it equally for all people. There's a kind of um, universality built into our moral notions. So if I claim a right for myself that you don't tread on my toe, then I ought to recognise that you've got a right against me that I don't tread on your toe. Um, that's just a, a kind of piece of the logic of ethics, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and now perhaps a question about reason, because uh, when people talk about the importance of philosophy in developing ethical systems, uh, yes. they tend to focus a lot on the role of reason in yeah. philosophy. And I mean, uh, recently I've read uh, Dan Sperber's and Hugo Mercier's book, The Enigma of Reason, and they collect a large amount of scientific data to show that um, reason is not absolutely reliable uh, in terms of trying to think, uh, to think impartially, uh, that reason operates, operates much more with the end of producing rationalizations to our behavior after the fact, and that uh, in trying to reach impartial conclusions about truth and reality and so on, it operates much better in groups of people with different ideas and different temperaments and so on. Uh, but, okay, but this is the scientific perspective on, on it. But from a philosophical perspective, what would be the limitations that reason has? Right. Well, in a sense, I think reason suffers from the same kind of debates that ethics does. Because reason, as I see it, is a normative term. I think, um, I think we shouldn't think of reason as a sort of little um, rational person inside the head, um, which is distinct from emotion and attitude and all the other cultural um, arrivals in our minds. Um, I think we just we talk of reason when we talk of one uh, consideration being a reason for another. So I talk of um, the fact that it's going to rain today is a reason for cancelling the picnic. The fact that it's going to rain may be a reason for carrying an umbrella, especially in England. Um, on the other hand, you know the fact that we're running out of sprouts may be a reason to go to the shops. I mean, the, what I do is identify a consideration as bearing favorably on a plan or an intention or a desire or a, a belief. Um, so I see reason as um, something that we talk about reason when we're advancing considerations for or against particular intentions, plans, pro uh, propositions and beliefs. Um, now, of course, the trouble is that reason then is as contested as other parts of ethics. And in a sense, you can see reason as a word in which we do ethics for the mind, ethics for things like beliefs, attitudes, judgments, and so on. Um, so um, if, I, if you say that um, you know, the fact that uh, you're treading on my toe is no reason for you to move, Obviously, I think that's a really bad judgment of yours, um, but it's not a judgment I might find it easy to shift. I mean, I can't just say, reason tells me that it is. You say, no, I don't see that any reasons. Uh, I might like to shift my foot off yours, but I, if I don't like to, I don't see that reason has anything to do with it. So reason is as contestable as other moral and ethical and normative judgments. Basically, reason is in the space of norms. We, we like to insist on norms of reason. Um, so, for example, I think that um, if somebody believes in the young earth creationists, say in America, somebody, they believe that the earth is about 6,000 years old, because that's, that accords with sort of biblical chronology. 
Um, I think they're completely mad, completely unreasonable. Um, there's a huge amount of authoritative science that tells us that it's about four and a half billion years old, four and a half thousand million years old. Um, so they take something as a reason, as a strong reason for believing one thing, and I think it's no reason at all. Um, I could call them unreasonable, um, but to prove that they're unreasonable, I had to go into the detail, the number of uniformities of nature, a number of scientific laws or apparent laws, which all converge on telling us that the age of the Earth is many thousands of millions of years old, or a half thousand million. Um, evidence from isotopes, ev evidence from radioactivity, evidence from strat stratigraphic analysis, evidence from evolutionary history, all those point in the same direction. Uh, and against that, they have one book, or two books, the, the Judaic record of kings and things. Uh, and I say, well, that, that just doesn't stand against it. It's totally unreasonable to take that as definitive in a way that the science is definitive. But they're going to say, no, it's not. <laughs> the, the Bible or the Torah is the word of God, and you know, God tells us that it's 6,000 years old, that's the end of it. And, of course, I think that's unreasonable. So we go on. But the argument goes on about reason just as badly as it goes on about, um, um, you know, whether it's okay to uh, um, treat prisoners a certain way or whether it's okay to um, eat in restaurants while other people are starving across the world. So, so ethics and judgments of reason, I think, are un un unhappily quite alike. Now you're right that there's been a movement in philosophy quite really quite recent, I think, which tries to say that reasons that virtually every normative issue is better discussed in terms of reasons. And I'm not sure that's true. I don't think it's an advantage. Um, you could do it, but I'm not sure it's getting you any further. Uh, because reason doesn't stand like the voice of God telling everybody the same thing. Well, the voice of God never does that, but, um, but people like to think of it as doing so. Mm -hmm. God, God tells different people lots of different things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Okay, so um, there are people, and I don't know if I'm going to be a bit unfair here or not, and please correct me if I'm mm -hmm. wrong, but there are people that uh, it seems to me uh, look at reason uh, as if it was a tele a teleological. Uh, mm -hmm. so, for ex so, for example, uh, Peter Singer in the book The Expanding Circle right. uh, a, a, a kind of says that one reason uh, in the evolutionary scene uh, get, gets put into place cognitively in our minds when it evolves, that because we have this sense that when people when other people behave towards us in a certain manner uh, that we don't like it mm -hmm. and and then also because we have keen selection and reciprocal altruism we then expand it to our families and friends and mm -hmm. when reason gets into the picture that it would be kind of inevitable that we would expand these rights, these ways we think that we shouldn't treat ourselves, our family and our friends to eventually the entire humanity. So what would you say about that? Well, I mean, Peter is following, a, a, I mean, he is a utilitarian in the sense that he, the ultimate ethical standard is welfare, the welfare of sentient creatures. Um, but in that respect, in respect of the, uh, the universalization properties of reason, he's following the Kantian tradition. I mean, I think the first person to hope to get substantive moral claims um, simply out of the conception, a conception of reason um, was probably Immanuel Kant. I mean, Aristotle thinks it's reasonable to be good um, but he, I don't think Aristotle thought that 
reason had a kind of authority that determined ethics, whereas I think Kant did think that, and I think Peter Singer thinks that. Um, I don't think it's right. I mean, it seems to me, first of all, I don't, it's not at all, I think, consistent with an evolutionary picture, because an evolutionary picture, typically, if, if you talk about human life as we best understand it to have been in the millennia before history began, um, was almost certainly tribal. And if there's one thing that a tribal ethic gives you, it's not an expanding circle, it's a tight circle. You might um, have reciprocal relations with your kin and with other members of the tribe, with your society. But when you come across other societies, by and large, you kill them. I mean, it's, uh, this is how chimpanzees behave, and it's very likely how people behaved in the early days of humanity. I mean, all the evidence from um, not just fossils, but uh, prehistoric bones and so on, suggests violence was the norm. It was the, the way people behaved, by and large. Many, many people are, you know, found in uh, prehistoric tombs and so on who have been killed in quite nasty ways with blunt axes and stone tools and have their throats cut and God knows what. So, so I think we've got to be very careful about, um, you know, this rather um, automatic expansion of the circle. Um, and still today, you look at uh, uh, someone like Donald Trump, he doesn't care a hoot about the rest of the world. He wants America first. He's a perfect example of a tribal leader um, with a large tribe, admittedly, but still a tribal leader. And he doesn't care about separating Mexican kids from their parents, doing terrible things to prisoners, um, all kinds of stuff, if it can be seen to the benefit of his tribe. Um, but... If Peter comes along and tells Donald Trump that he's being irrational, Trump will say, no, I, I put America first. This is my priority. This is the... and so on. And, of course, a lot of Republicans agree with him, unfortunately. So I think the world is, is not hospitable to the, any idea that the expanding circle is automatic. I think it's got to be really worked for. You've got to shift people's attitudes. Um, but getting all people to feel like brothers and sisters is a matter of shifting attitudes. There's no syllogism which tells them that that's true. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, okay, so now another question would be, can we derive an entire an ethical system just from science and scientific facts? No, um, the the old is ought gap. Um, yeah. it, it can be criticised. It's got to be very carefully framed and so on. But basically, there's there's always going to be a bridge between what the facts are like and how you care about them. Um, uh, that, that's obvious in what we just said about the expanding circle. Um, Peter Singer can point out that. Uh, welfare is increased um, across the world if America doesn't behave with you know, trade, tar trade tariffs and trade wars and so on. Um, and that's very nice and um, it will impress a lot of us, it would impress me, but there's no, um, no syllogism, no algorithm for making it impress uh, Mr. Trump. Um, he, he's going to persist in believing the other thing because... Uh, his basic ideology is selfish and tribal and nationalistic, and, um, and that's true of his followers. But like any democratic politician, he's got to appeal to his followers. That's <laughs> 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 <was> very sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, okay, so so um, I think Peter Singer was writing in a more optimistic age than that part section. <laughs> yeah, I guess the expanding circle was out perhaps 
30 years ago or or even yeah. more, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Welfare states, um, you know, the United Nations, all sorts of things were very hopeful signs. But now they've gone into reverse. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right. But okay, so would you say that uh, the reason why we can't derive a complete uh, ethical system from science is because uh, if we go along with science, we obtain an infinite or ne nearly infinite amount of facts about the world. And to create an ethical system, we have to choose between yeah. those facts? I think that's absolutely right. Um, I mean, and, and also the facts don't always point in a, a desirable direction. Let me give you an example. Um, it's a, a, a paradox, a difficulty of uh, economic savings theory. Um, how much should we spend and how much should we save for the benefit of future generations? Well, now, if you suppose that the return is positive, that is, every dollar invested um, will give a, return, a positive return, so it will give the next generation slightly more than a dollar. Um, and if you suppose that generations are going to go on forever, uh, you, you rapidly get the result that you should never spend any money. You should save it all, because the net human welfare over generations is going to be increased if money doesn't disappear in consumption. If it's invested for the sake of the future, you're always going to get an expanding pot. Um, so, you know, if you suppose that welfare varies with wealth, you get the paradoxical result that it's never right to save anything. Okay, so I guess we were talking about science, scientific facts, the possibility yeah. of deriving ethical systems from science. Uh, mm. And I guess that the next question I would pose is, so we can't derive an entire ethical system just out of scientific facts, because mm. one of the main reasons is that we would have an infinite set of scientific facts. and. Yeah. We, sh we would need to have beforehand uh, axio uh, moral axioms to yeah. be able to choose among them. Yes, right. yes. I mean, um, you know, the history of ethics shows us a, a lot of this. Um, uh, as I expect your, your listeners know, um, Jeremy Bentham, one of the first utilitarians, thought that it was all straightforward, you could just observe in a sense, you observed happiness and you maximized it, and that was the end of it. And of course, in, almost immediately, uh, first of all, John Stuart Mill realized that happiness is not a, a common currency. It doesn't, it doesn't work like a, um, a you know, number of um, dollar bills that you have, um, because it's a very variable thing, there's so-called higher pleasures, lower pleasures, there are pleasures which you wouldn't give up for anything, and there are pleasures which you don't care very much about. Um, and, uh, and of course, then the distributions of happiness. There's some people you might think who don't deserve to be happy, because, for example, their happiness lies in domination of others. They're not happy unless they're cock of the walk. Does their happiness matter? Um, they're not happy unless they're sadists and inflicting pain on other people. Does that happiness matter? So on. So well, the happiness of the, um, the Roman crowds looking at gladiatorial fights, that's not a very edifying thing to maximize. So, um, so you, you really have to be very careful about thinking that it's simple um, because the entire history of ethics shows that it's not. Um, and so the, the science is not going to charge it with a, um, you know, an objective and um, empirical answer to these questions. Mm -hmm. And do these moral axioms that we have to have before and in trying to set an ethical system uh, have to be 
uh, always uh, self-evidently true and uh, universalizable or not? No, I don't think so. I think that, um, uh, I mean, again, going back to Bentham and Mill, their hope was for a, a kind of axiomatic system. You'd have an overarching principle, the principle of utility, you somehow frame it so it looked plausible, and you could derive moral results from that. Um, more and more moral thinkers, not just myself, but others, have gone back to what's in effect a much more Aristotelian picture in which we have quite a lot of values. Some of them cohere together, um, some of them conflict. Um, so there may be a trade-off. Um, uh, in our own lives, we know that. There's a trade-off between uh, how much effort you expend on your friends, how much effort you expend on your family, how much effort you expend on yourself. Um, and these things may look different at different times. And the idea of a system just waiting to be axiomatized and then in some sort of computing way churning out answers to practical problems has appealed to very few people in recent uh, moral philosophy. Um, going back to Aristotle, you find you start in the middle of things uh, in medias res, that is, you start um, making judgments, and then you realize that it's difficult to make your judgments all coherent, so you start to tinker, and gradually you hope to build up a kind of organic set of Maybe even principles is the wrong word. Principles is very contested uh, in moral philosophy, but an organic set of judgments with a, at least a pattern to them. Some things you regard as important, other things you don't regard as so important. Some things take priority over others, and so on. So you get a nest or a, uh, an amalgam of um, what are sometimes called prima facie results or prima facie duties. And um, your best hope is that your overall system is defensible. But it won't be defensible because it's um, derived from few simple self-evident axioms. That's, that's I think, a, a will of the wisp, a pie, pie in the sky. <laughs> yes, but uh, when we talk about the ontological ethics, and perhaps a good example of it would be human rights, because yeah. I, I mean, we, we, if we are to have human rights, they have to be based on certain moral values, which mm -hmm. we cannot really question. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, it may be that a uh, for example, a tribunal, a court of law, um, that has to work with codified laws, with, um, and those are going to have a kind of absolute flavor, they'll have an absolute core. Um, but even courts of law um, find that it's not easy to draw up the rules. Um, if you, um, uh, I, mean, for, I mean, this may be a slightly absurd example, but I think it makes the point. Um, you'd think it might be quite easy for a government. Um, a government is there for the welfare of the people. I would say that's it's what it has to do. Uh, to promote that welfare, it needs welfare. It needs various things like um, police, it needs a judiciary, it needs um, defence, it needs. Um, uh, to attend the welfare of the people by, by me medical um, uh, services and so on. For all that, it needs taxation. It needs resources to enable it to perform those tasks. So you might think that it would be quite simple to develop a tax code. It's not. <laughs> the, the English, <laughs> uh, the British tax code, I believe, now runs to 17,000 pages. Mm. Yes. Uh, no, no one person can master it. Uh, you have to have specialist accountants, accountants who deal with 
corporation tax, accountants who deal with inheritance tax, and accountants who deal with this, that, and the other. So, so it's uh, it, it proves incredibly difficult. And every time a government thinks, well, this would be a fair fair taxation system, you tax I don't know, the, the rich more than the poor, for example, that sounds like a good principle. Um, but then you come to the idea that, well, we we want to incentivize people. We want we don't want the rich just to stop working because we're taking all their money in tax. Uh, or, um, and of course, if you're in a competitive economy, you don't want companies to go abroad because they're overtaxed. So you want them to uh, pay just the right amount of tax, and then you get um, different industries making different claims, and so on. So complexity builds and builds and builds. Um, and eventually, finding any rhyme or reason in those 17,000 pages is going to be <laughs> most impossible. <laughs> and that's a, I think that's a model for human life, I'm afraid. It is a bit like that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I mean, perhaps a question, a question that I would pose now is, uh, has there any been really um, uh, an ethical system with um, rules, let's put it that way, that uh, that add really no exceptions whatsoever. So, for example, when referring to these people, usually give the example of religion as having a set of moral truths mm -hmm. that are set in place supposedly mm -hmm. by God. Uh, and that uh, th they have no exceptions whatsoever. But e even religious people uh, do, um, usually don't really universalize their set of moral truths to, to encompass the entirety of humanity, right? No, and even the rules that we have got admit of um, elasticity. Uh, exceptions. I mean, the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Yeah. Um, okay, what about Christian wars? That been, what about uh, Islam? What about, I mean, uh, God may tell you not to kill, but he doesn't tell you exactly what the, what the limits of the <laughs> are. Um, now, of course, uh, it's possible to be an absolute pacifist, saying that we, we, we must never kill. Um, but then you might get cases, you know, where mercy killing is suggested. The usual case is um, uh, the lorry driver, the truck driver, who is caught in a burning cab, and you can't get him out, but you could shoot him. Uh, otherwise, he's going to slowly burn to death. So it would seem the right thing to do would be to shoot him. And uh, if, if your religion says, no, no, you can't do that, then I think so much the worse for your religion. It's, it's, uh, it's giving you a false certainty, a certainty which the case does not admit of. Um, and similar for many cases. Um, you know, obviously, uh, some religionists take uh, a shall not kill to apply to very early term babies, uh, fetuses. Um, Others say, no, no, it only applies to persons, and these things are not yet persons. They're, they're more like eggs or acorns than they're, they're like uh, chickens or oak trees. So it's, um, uh, it, it always le leads to um, hard cases. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when we talk about religion mm -hmm. in ethical terms and from a philosophical perspective, would you say that um, what we call religious is not really referring to uh, an, a moral system that is absolutist, but rather that it is justified on the basis of some sort of di um, divine character, for example, a god? Well, I think people, I, I mean, I believe that a religion is basically a second-hand philosophy. It's um, it's a, it's a it's a set of ideas about how to live, which is drummed up and 
um, impressed in people's minds by the devices of religious conversion, religious authority, religious instruction. Um, so typically a religion would hope to get hold of people at a very young age. It impresses on them the character of sacred things in, in that, that society. And they go away convinced that there's an authority which has told them that uh, killing is wrong, or that adultery is wrong, or that coveting your neighbor's ass is wrong. And, um, uh, and, and they, they believe that without any further thought. And that's no doubt from a sort of evolutionary point of view, maybe quite functional. Maybe good that enough people in a society have rather a simple, fairly well understood set of rules and they try to live by that. Um, and there's, there's evidence actually, I think, that um, um, communities and societies that are, have that kind of ethos um, do better than ones which uh, are secular and educated and in which everybody tries to think for themselves. But um, but I prefer the second sort of society. I, uh, I don't like the idea of um, uh, just marching in step like an army uh, of, of thoughtless sort of zombies. Um, that's not enlightenment, as Kant said. Um, that's uh, that's uh, turning people into um, ciphers. And it's very dangerous because, of course, the next thing that happens is a uh, it may be a theological leader or it may be a secular leader um, comes along, often harnesses the authority of the church, and then all hell breaks loose. I mean, that's the way fascism worked. Uh, that's the way dictatorships worked in Spain and Portugal. Um, the church collaborated with uh, some pretty nasty regimes. And of course, once you think that right is on your side, you think you're permitted to do anything to crush dissent and to crush opposition. So I think that the authoritarian tendencies of human beings are very badly served. They're aided by um, the authority of uh, theocracies and priests. And I think that's a very bad thing, mm -hmm. very, very dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and what are the internal contradictions of moral relativism? Well, it's difficult to, to um, I mean, the, the problem with moral relativism, I think, is that it's, it, it pretends to be a moral position or a meta-ethical position, but it's not really a coherent one. Uh, so I like to illustrate this with an example. So here's an example which is, um, has been an issue in, in Britain uh, quite recently. Um, should fox hunting on horses and with dogs be allowed? Um, so some people say yes, it's a part of the old British way of life. Farmers have always done this, landowners do it. Uh, other people say no, it's cruel. It's uh, it's a nasty sport, it's bad, it's obviously cruel to the fox, it's, it encourages um, unpleasant features in the, in the hunters. So that, that's the issue. Now I might hold, what well, I might stand on one side of that issue, I, in fact I do, I, I hold it's a, a shame and it probably ought to be a disallowed. Um, but other people, Roger Scruton, a friend of mine, stands on the other side of the issue, so he thinks it ought to be perfectly legal. And we each have arguments and we can to and fro about it. Now suppose a relativist comes in and says, ah, it's true for Simon that fox hunting should be banned, but it's true for Roger that fox hunting should be allowed. It's just they have their different truths. Truth is relative to the opinions of different people, something like that. Well, what does that mean? Um, if you think it's true for me that fox hunting should be allowed, and it's true for Roger that it's not allowed, what position does that give you on fox hunting? Nothing. 
it, it leaves it open. So do you, the relativist, have a view or not? Well, the relativist, I'd say, well, my view is science. Um, okay, in that case, you think it's true that fox hunting should be banned. Not just true for Simon, but true. Um, that is, you campaign for fox hunting to be banned. You um, vote for politicians who say they'll ban it, ban it, and um, if you feel strongly enough about it, you go and stand in front of fox hunts with banners saying stop it, and so on. On the other hand, if you agree with Roger, you go the other way. Um, but basically, saying it's true for him that P and it's true for him that not P is not really making a useful move of any kind. It's not giving you a moral solution, and it's not telling you how to think about it. Um, so, so it's a, it's a sort of way of dismissing the debate without contributing to it, and certainly without resolving it. So, um, so I think it's just a, a sideshow. It's a, in a sense a, um, uh, uh, it's, it's like somebody who get, you know, there's a room in which people are debating this thing and the relativist stands outside the room with the earplugs in, um, then I, you know, I can't hear anything. And that's not a move in a debate. It's not even a move to say something interesting about a debate. It's just a withdrawal from a debate, which is sometimes a practical stance which has its virtues, but not, not, not when it's a question of what the law should be. Um, then you have to say yes or no. Mm -hmm. And aren't they contradicting themselves from the start when they say something along the lines of uh, oh, there are no absolute moral truths, because yeah. that, by That's, itself, <laughs> is an yeah. absolute moral truth, right? Yes, yes, well, that's, that's, a, that's right. There's a, um, uh, a, a sort of self-refutation. It's an old um, problem in moral philosophy. Um, it's in the, the Theotetus, and the some, uh, Plato's, uh, and it's sometimes called the peritrope where the relativist tries to say something which by his own lights can't be true because it's within the scope of his relativism. And um, that's, uh, that's certainly a problem. It's, um, um, it's like somebody who says, all generalizations are false. Well, that's itself a generalization. So does it stand in its own scope? <laughs> does it contradict itself? Um, I think relativists can kind of wriggle out of that argument, but it's certainly something they've got to think about. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, and would you classify nihilism under the rubric of moral relativism? Um, well, I think the moral relativist is uh, aspires to be a nihilist, but um, mm. but I think it's Nihilism is, I think, in a sense, different. Um, nihilism is a mood or an attitude um, probably best illustrated in some existentialist works. Um, Camus, the outsider, um, becomes disenchanted with life and with the reasonings that people use to try and get moral values out of life, and it, it, it begins to think nothing matters. So nihilism is, I think, fundamentally the view that nothing matters. Um, and um, it attempts to give you a, a sort of disenchanted, perhaps cynical way of thinking that you know, humanity is like a lot of ants, they scurry around, they fight, they die, it doesn't matter, it's like an anthill. You just don't, uh, you know, the wise person just stands back from it. Mm -hmm. It's a mood of uh, sort of disenchantment. It's, it's not, it's a, it's a cousin of a kind of religious disengagement too. I mean, Buddhism um, counsels a certain disengagement from the world of desire, the world of ambition, the world of plans. Mm -hmm. um, so the Buddhist monk sits silently in his monastery 
um, staring at the wall. That's a kind of, I think that's a kind of nihilism. Um, but it doesn't go along, or it's supposed not to go along with cynicism and despair. It's supposed to be quite a, a calm and peaceful sort of rejection of um, human motivation, human life, human desire. Um, myself, I can't admire it. I think it's a, a feeble a way of living. Um, but I think nihilism appeals to people in certain, you know, usually rather miserable moods. And the only solution is to give them something to worry about, give them something to think about or care about, because human cares will come back soon enough. A nihilist who's hungry thinks that he is going to want food. <laughs> 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 right. Um, and would you say that uh, another contradiction that comes from moral relativists is that um, when they say that all moral values are equally valid, mm -hmm. I, I mean, that, that's really not true even for them because in order for someone to perform an action they have to be motivated by yes. by moral values and and so they have to choose between yes. moral values to perform an action otherwise they would just sit still and even that would be a decision that would be, that's a decision and an action yes i mean the buddhist is um <sighs> He may think of himself as free from the world of desire, but if he sees some value in sitting silent and looking at a wall, then, well, seeing value in something is close to wanting it. So it's, um, it, it's, it's, it's not true. I mean, his action has a motivation, and the motivation is, in a sense, a kind of value or a kind of desire. It's, um, it's 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 difficult to step aside um uh, it's a bit like people say oh with me it's not a matter of reason it's a matter of faith and of course, faith is supposed to be a good word um, um well it's a good word when it's your faith but when it's somebody else's faith then reason comes into it and uh, when the faith starts telling you to do things like um kill the infidel or whatever it might do then uh, then of course you're entering the world of practice and ethics and you can't just withdraw and say oh well, you know for me it's different no uh, you've got to behave like a human being and if you don't you suffer penalty mm -hmm. yes and um would you um, would you say that if we were to prove scientifically speaking uh, that there is absolutely no free will that that by itself would completely undermine the notion of personal responsibility um well if it would i mean it's, of course free will is a very slippery concept but if the idea is to undermine personal responsibility, I think that's um, uh, that's a very foolish thing to try to do. I think, um, I mean, the very simplest, we are responsible in the sense that we're part of the causal chains whereby things happen. Um, if I'm driving a car and being suicidal, I shut my eyes, then I crash into a bus full of people and kill a lot of people. I'm responsible for those deaths because I'm directly a major part of the causal story that led to their deaths. And that's, in that sense, the thermostat is responsible for the temperature in your room. The thermostat goes wrong, it's responsible for the room getting too hot or too cold. So, um, a flaw or fault in a thermostat makes the thermostat responsible for what then happens. And a flaw or fault in a human being can make a human being responsible for what happens. So I think responsibility is going to stay. I don't think you can... I mean, Dostoevsky is quite good on this. He, um, 
he talks of um, uh, um, people doing terrible things and says, you know, that um, in Brothers Karamazov, um, Ivan tells the story of a landowner who uh, a little boy on his estate threw a stone which hit his favourite dog and the landowner retaliated by having his, his own dogs tear the little boy to pieces in front of his mother. And um, Alyosha, the saintly person, tries to say Christ will forgive him. And Ivan says, I don't want Christ to forgive him. <laughs> and a world in which he's forgiven is worse than a world in which he's made to suffer some consequences for that terrible act. And I think that's, I'm on Ivan's side. I think that's, um, uh, that's part of the human world. We do hold each other responsible. I mean, there was a, a sort of liberal movement in maybe the middle of the last century, you know, that it's somehow civilized to regard all crime as a kind of illness, as a kind of, um, uh, you know, something like getting a cold for which you're not responsible. Um, and that was supposed to be sort of a, a, an improvement in our morality, our, our way of thinking about things. Uh, and then a, a philosopher called Sir Peter Strawson, a very distinguished Oxford philosopher, wrote a, a wonderful paper called Freedom and Responsibility. And he pointed out that um, being treated like a patient um, as somebody to be managed or handled or um, somebody in the grip of a um, uh, some strange um, addiction or obsession. And that's taking away personal responsibility, but it's also taking away the basis of self-respect. Um, it is demeaning, it's treating the person like a child or an animal um, rather than as a responsible human being, a human being that answers to reason and ought to have a voice in their heads telling them not to do whatever it was they were doing. So um, so when someone like Bill Clinton comes along and he's been putting his, uh, his sex um, and says, oh, I'm a sex addict, he's, he's claiming a sort of immunity through the absence of responsibility. But he's also forfeiting any respect. It's a, it's a, it's, a, it's like I'm a child. I can't help it. Um, and you say, well, you bloody well should be able to help it at your age. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, right. But okay, it's it's interesting that you brought up. Um, Ivan Karamazov from Dostoevsky's novel because um, isn't couldn't telling the truth to people sometimes be cruel? So, for, uh, an example: if someone is deeply religious and is dying in his bed and he wants to believe that he's going to die, but he will meet God or his family or something like that. Wouldn't it, couldn't we consider to be cruel the fact that, for example, someone, an atheist, went there and said, oh, that's childish or that's foolish, God doesn't mm. exist and you're wrong? Yes, oh yes, I mean, I, you know, I, I, um, I'm as atheist, I think, as anybody can be. I have no use whatever for the concept of God. But when I find somebody who does, I don't automatically, you know, put up my fists and start fighting them. And I wouldn't dream of telling somebody on their deathbed that, you know, all their hopes. Well, I might tell a terrorist on his deathbed. That he, <laughs> but um, but somebody I loved and, and cared for, they, they have the consolation of religion. They think that the Virgin Mary is going to look after them or something. Then. Um, uh, let them be. It's not doing any harm at that point. I mean, there's a sense in which I like to distinguish between um, people who are religious and people who are what I call religionists. Now, somebody can be religious just in the sense of having a rather 
uh, spiritual attitude to life. Um, they may go and look at the night sky, they feel sort of the strangeness of it, the magic of it. They start thinking thoughts about how did all this come about, how's it going to end, what's it all for. That may, those may be religious thoughts. I've got no worry about that at all. But when they're religionists, that means they take authority to be vested in the priest or the holy book, the tradition, the, um, uh, the how they've been brought up to think, and they start telling people what to do. They have moral and political opinions, which are supposed to derive authority from these sources, the Quran or the Bible or the Talmud or the imam or the priest or the rabbi and they're religionists uh, they're bringing their religion into practical affairs and there i think one has to fight i have to say no you have no magic source of authority um, if you choose to listen to the rabbi or the priest or the imam that's your choice but then we have to look at what he's telling you to do and try to work out for ourselves, whether it's moral or whether it's immoral, often is, um, and uh, and treat you accordingly. So, if some terrorist comes along and says, "Well, my imam tells me that the right thing to do is to kill it, infidels," I say, "Well, that may be true, and you're off to prison. You 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 don't get a get out of jail free card because some moron with a beard tells you that the right thing to do was something or other." Sorry, I mean a long beard. It's not, not your kind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> okay, uh, but okay. So now, now another question: um, How should we weigh pleasure when developing an ethical system? Because I mean, when people and people that part uh, aren't particularly philosophers look at moral systems, they perhaps tend to associate them with being conscientious and, or, and always doing the right thing and avoiding bad behavior, uh, and that could put off <laughs> hedonists and people like that, but it also takes pl human pleasure into account, right? right? Yes, uh, uh, de uh, I think any decent moral code or system. Uh, I mean, I've, we've talked a little bit about whether system is the right word, but I think any decent morality would give a perfectly um, central place to the idea of pleasure. Pleasant lives are much nicer than unpleasant lives. And a lot of morality is, is, is about making life pleasant for each other. Um, just as, say, politeness is about making life pleasant for each other. Um, the, the norms of politeness that um, I don't tread on your toes, I don't speak too loud, I don't, uh, you know, shove my face in yours when we talk, um, so on. Um, I don't snatch food off your plate. Uh, all those norms um, are there in order to make social life pleasanter than it would otherwise be. And they have an authority because that matters. Uh, it can be very unpleasant to be... Uh, at the, at the receiving end of impolite behavior, or just to be in the same railway carriage where two people are behaving impolitely, can be, can be very unpleasant. So, so in that sense, pleasantness or pleasure, if we like, um, has a very important uh, um, part to play in thinking about how to live and thinking about morality. Of course, what the hedonist doesn't like is when the moralist says, well, yes, but sometimes you have to, you know, sacrifice your own pleasures. I mean, the, you can't be on holiday all the time because your children need clothes and food. You can't, um, you know, spend all your time with wine, women and song if there's world's work to be done. Uh, and sometimes it's just self-interest. You know, if you don't um, get down to it, then you may be happy spending money today, but you won't have any tomorrow, and you'll be even more unhappy than you would otherwise have been. 
So self-interest and concern for your kin and your friends and your society determine a kind of um, balancing of immediate pleasure against a sort of common sense prudence. And behaving prudently is often um, necessary, unfortunately. I mean, if we lived in the Garden of Eden, we just pluck food off trees, and you know, it would be, um, be easy to be a hedonist. Um, but in the real world, it's not. Um, yes, but on the other end, perhaps it would be boring. <laughs> yes, it would be very boring. Yeah, that's right. Yes, life is about competition and struggle and achievement. <laughs> as much as it is about uh, eating grapes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And another question that I'm very much interested in is uh, the death of God, as people worried a lot about in the 19th century, particularly yeah. Nietzsche and mm -hmm. Dostoevsky and other people, because, um, because th throughout most of human history, people lived under religious systems of one sort or the other, uh, there are still a lot of people that think that yes. life would have no meaning without religion and without the existence of some no. sort of divinity or things like that. But uh, doesn't science by itself, by virtue of uh, teaching us that, for example, we have evolved emotions, feelings, mm -hmm. more, uh, moral sentiments, and so on, and that they are absolutely real, as everything else also gives meaning to life. Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, I believe that 100%. Um, it's always struck me as odd that people who um, uh, get extremely bored and fidgety and so on, after spending an hour in church on Sundays, think that somehow an eternity of singing hymns and looking at God is, is, is going to give life meaning. It's going to make it absolutely intolerable. <laughs> sort of, uh, I think, um, you know, um, uh, but the, the idea that sort of it, it's all meaningless unless there's a God, I think is is just extraordinarily foolish. As you rightly say, we have emotions, we have cares, we have um, uh, things that bother us, and those things one by one give meaning to moments in our lives. Um, and I think if you can find a meaning in each moment of your life, that's what it is for your life to have a meaning. Um, it doesn't have to be a sort of a goal beyond life, to which life is a means, um, that's not where you find meaning. I mean, the mother, uh, you know, the baby, the newly born baby smiles at the mother. That gives life meaning for the mother. Gives it an enormous amount of meaning. It's a fantastic sort of rush of um, endorphins and pleasure and emotion. And, and of course, if conversely some uh, awful event happens and snatches the baby away, that matters, it matters more than anything else. And um, those things mattering um, for good or bad, um, that's what gives life meaning. And of course, the nihilist, I think, who finds no meaning in life, um, somebody for whom nothing matters is, you know, basically depressed and maybe suicidal because that's the his problem is he can't find something to to care about and having nothing to care about is next but thought of dying um, but you don't need God for that mm -hmm. that, that and, gets in the way mm -hmm. and couldn't immortality even more easily lead to lack of meaning because I mean if we were to live forever <laughs> yeah, I, I can I can very easily imagine that it would become very tedious with yeah. time yes. oh. and, and and also apart from that the fact that we wouldn't really take issue with the consequences of our actions well 
Um, yes, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the famous opera about that is the Macropolis case by Janacek, um, uh, where Elena Macropolis has uh, lived for, th I think it's three or four hundred years, and seen everything and done everything, and life is absolutely tedious. And that's only 300 years, that's not forever. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's, a, there's some very amusing um, sort of, uh, uh, there's a uh, book by um, Julian Barnes, who's a novelist, um, The History of the World in Ten and a Half Chapters, which is quite a very funny philosophical novel. And um, in the last chapter, you've got somebody who's in heaven. And he's, uh, the thing that's given his life most meaning down on, uh, on earth was golf. So now he's in heaven, but he's in, he in heaven, you see, nothing can go wrong. So every time he plays golf, he holes out in 18 strokes. It's a hole in one for each of the 18 holes. So, so there's never any, it suddenly becomes pointless. There's never any point in doing it unless there's a possibility of going wrong. But in heaven, there's no possibility of going wrong. So golf, golf loses all its attractions. Uh, in which case it's not heaven because, you know, it's, there's been a loss. So there's a sort of contradiction and imagine everything going all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's hell then instead yes. of heaven, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> okay, so perhaps and just to not to not take much more of your time, Dr. Yep. Blackburn, uh, yep. one last question that is um, what is for you the relationship between beauty and truth and morality? Because I, I will give you my take on it and then perhaps you can comment on it. That is, uh, I relate beauty to truth in the sense that, uh, again, from, an ev from a scientific evolutionary perspective, that uh, the bodily traits that we find the skews mm. to good mm. genes, health, fertility, and so on, uh, are good. So that, that would be, uh, or, or perhaps that would correspond to, some, uh, to something that is true out there, because it corresponds to something that is based on reality, that is the genes, health, fertility, and so on, and it is related to what we deem to be beautiful. In, in the opposite sex or the same sex, of course. And uh, the relationship between beauty and morality, I put it in the way that uh, when we have contact with, for example, uh, the deeds of great men, we usually uh, are, get an incentive to move towards a goal, to do something that could be considered to be good and, yeah. and things like that. Yes, I, I, I think that's right, Roberto. It's a, it's, um, uh, um, it, it's, a, it's a very complicated problem because, um, well, for example, in the 18th century, I think the first really naturalist philosophers, people like Hume, thought the um, right thing to think about, um, say, landscapes, was that we found beautiful uh, productive landscapes, landscapes that sort of fields of corn, um, productive forests, uh, you know, fertile landscapes, landscapes that are nicely farmed. These are these are beautiful. That's that's all there is to it. Um, so there was a direct connection between beauty and utility. Um, and of course, as you say, evolutionarily, it's it's easy to suppose that that's especially true of our appreciation of um, people. You know, the, the, the beautiful person is uh, athletic, um, or perhaps in the case of women, have very obvious signs of health, um, good, good childbearing prospects, and so on. Um, the, um, the, the human view got a bit of a knock on the head culturally, because about 30 years later, after he wrote 
he was writing in about 1750, in fact, even as he was writing, the, an aesthetic was starting up, which um, valued the sublime rather than the peaceful or the productive or the fertile. So um, the hero became sort of not so much a, um, a, a good father figure, um, but the, the Byronic hero, um, Byron was lame, but he and he was dangerous, mad, bad, and dangerous to know. But that became the attractive sort of figure, the romantic hero. And of course, um, the most beautiful landscapes started to see not nice fertile landscapes, not nice fertile farmsteads and things, but mountains and uh, seas and storms and so on. So you've got an aesthetic of people going to the Alps instead of going and looking at Burgundy or somewhere that would have met Hume's approval. And um, it's harder to account for that in terms of utility. I mean, um, if you read 18th century writing, something like the Alps, they'd have called Horrid. You know, these are that's a place you go through on the way to Italy, which is lovely. Um, whereas by the 19th century, the people troop into the Alps. Um, and that's a shift in sensibility, the romantic, the romantic revolution. Um, and it's very difficult to see it as having a function in terms of utility or uh, some other currency. I think what it shows is that people, um, you know, we're very flexible and we can suddenly find something attractive because it offers a challenge and something worth 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 pitting ourselves again and so mountaineering becomes a, a natural activity um and you get people you know dangling on vertical rock climbs so very very dangerous not good for them not a, not a uh, prudent thing to do but exciting and, uh, and therefore attractive to people so i think the, the you know the the relationship between aesthetics and utility is going to be complicated. And of course, nowadays, uh, the, the most highly valued works of art don't even aspire to being beautiful. They aspire to being edgy and difficult and challenging and so on. Um, they're usually not beautiful either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, so, <laughs> okay, so. Uh, just before we finish here, yeah. Dr. Blackburn, would you like perhaps to share with people where they can follow your work on the internet? And I, I don't know, perhaps you're working on a, another book at the moment that you might want to share with people? Or Well, I'm, I've got a sort of hope of producing a book on um, contemporary pragmatism one day. <laughs> but it's uh, it's still in the um, in the stage of getting fertilized. It's not it's not been born yet. <laughs> um, but that's what I, I'm, I'm interested in the pragmatist tradition. This is people like Richard Rorty and Bob Brandon, uh, Wilfred Sellers, Wittgenstein, later Wittgenstein. Uh, and I'd like to try and pull my thoughts about those people together uh, into a book. Um, but I've just published a little book on truth, it's called Truth or On Truth, uh, which is a follow-up to a 2005 book which I wrote about uh, postmodernist views about truth, Nietzsche especially. We haven't talked much about Nietzsche, but I think it's very interesting. Um, and uh, so the idea of truth in general has always perplexed me and interested me. That's, that's, that's the topic. If people want to look at my work, um, my own website is easily available. If you look to look, just Google my name, Simon Blackburn, and I think the first thing is Wikipedia, which um, is, is just skip over that. And I think the next, so the second or third website you'll come to is my Cambridge University website. It's um, www two slash cam slash ac class oh slash phil slash philosophy cam ac uk in my name so it's pretty obvious and then there's 
papers, um, books, one or two jokes, reviews, and people can see roughly what I've been about for the last uh, 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I will leave all of that in the description box of this video. And yes. Dr. Blackburn, it was really a true pleasure to talk with you today. It was a really pleasant and stimulating conversation. And perhaps I hope to have you again in the future on the channel to talk perhaps about Nietzsche. I don't know since you well, refer to him. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Roberto. It's been a pleasure. And if I may say so, you, you have a very, very good understanding of, of, of the questions to ask and uh, of what I've been trying to say. Thank you. Okay, so it's been a pleasure. And please don't end the call. I will just uh, finish the recording, but don't end the call. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to my channel and for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel last February and have, be, have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge. Any amount, even one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke and Nan Blanchett. Thank you for all.